All right, so I have not gotten started on this yet. This is exactly as it was handed to me. I did not take a part off of this thing. Um, the friend of mine who owns this had already stripped it down uh, and was taking a look at it and had come across a project that I was working on for somebody else some time ago and thought to hit me up and see if I would be willing to take this on. And absolutely I would. This is going to be a lot of fun. This project's going to be great. Uh, especially because he's not going for, you know, kind of standard cherry red, you know, which is really pretty, but you know, you do see it frequently. We're going to take it in a whole other direction. So let's take a look at this thing and see what we need to do. All right. So first off, this thing, it smells like an old closet. You know, you're kind of, uh, you know, it's like going to your grandpa's house and, you know, you wander into his study. It smells of leather bound books and, uh, <laughs> and dust and, you know, an old timber. Uh, but upon first glance, once you get past kind of the, you know, the desolation of the thing where it's stripped down to nothingness, you know, the foundation is really there. Uh, there are no visible breaks to the heel. The headstock has not been broken. There are no visible structural cracks around the nut or anything like that. So that's really good. Um, as far as mods go, uh, somebody did put what looks like a humbucker in this. Uh, it doesn't look like they used a template. It looks like they definitely eyeballed it. The edges of the route are not clean. And it, when it comes to the actual routing of the wires down and into the... Uh, the electronics cavity. Uh, they could have used a drill and drilled in from the side diagonally downward and created simply a tunnel. But I also know that SGs are so thin that uh, whoever did these mods obviously was kind of doing it, you know, on the kitchen table or, or in the garage. So uh, it can make people a little nervous to bore a hole down into these because if you do diagonally go in too wrong, you could pop out on the other side if you're not careful. So the headstock looks good. It's got the standard rounded off, you know, leaned against a wall kind of vibe going on. Uh, but we do have a problem with the back of the headstock. Luckily enough, somebody, whoever had refinished this, because it looks like it's been under the knife a few times, uh, they left the top of the headstock with the serial number alone. The only problem is, is that this has created an unnatural step. So the headstock is thinner around the tuners than it is around the very, very top of the headstock. I'm not worried about that as far as a structural ramification. I'm worried about blending that edge because that edge is not too good. So what we might have to actually do on that is slowly, because it's over the serial number and we can't disrupt the stamping and you can't sand that because the finish will stay in the mahogany and it, you'll lose the serial number. You'll be able to see it, but once you finish over it, the imprint's gonna be gone. So we've gotta be careful with that. We've actually gotta to try to chip away the finish, which looks like it's already doing, without marring the surface and while completely retaining the serial number. That's not gonna be particularly easy, but that's okay, we can make it happen. You know, if it was something that somebody was just gonna play the hell out of, I wouldn't really be too concerned about the serial. I would take lots of photographs, document it, you know, but this isn't a $250 guitar, you know, this isn't a dime a dozen. You know, you've got to remember that this bass was already being played, <laughs> you know, um, a year and a half before Woodstock. There's a lot of history in here. We've got to try to get it out of there without disrupting the original concept of the bass. Okay, so we tried chipping away with a knife first. Didn't work. Too many layers of clear over there. Some of it bonding, some of it not. You couldn't really see what you were getting at. So, uh, since the back of the headstock needed to be planed anyway, because whoever had sanded it before had created a lot of valleys while dodging the serial, I went ahead, used an orbital with some worn out 220 on it, and kind of just jabbed at it lightly. Uh, I would hit the area around the serial uh, with some intensity, just briefly, to heat up the material, and almost instantaneously the layer and layer and layer of clear coat that somebody had been spraying over this just chipped and fell away. Actually left us with a really good surface. The only problem is now the rest of the headstock 
uh, is a mess because it's very unlevel. So this is me leveling it out a little bit. Now, there were some residual bits of finish left in the cereal, and though it was still visible, I felt the need to knock them out so that we could have a more consistent um, imprint uh, as the finish you know, breaks down and we start to have uh, those edges uh, transmit through the finish. So this is me just knocking the finish out. Now, when you do this, don't dig into the wood. What you're gonna do is take that edge of that knife, put it against the remaining finish, and kind of just knock it off its pedestal. If you push it to the side hard enough, it's already delaming, and it should just chip right out. This will give you a good line where you still have that factory look serial number. I haven't even finished sanding this and, and tidied it up yet. And already we've got that, you know, retained history. So we're good. Okay, so here's the thing. We have a lot of tuner holes in here. Should have four uh, per. <laughs> Uh, we've got eight. It looks almost as though someone took a very similar tuner and they mounted it maybe upside down. Some of those screw holes fit, but then some not on the other side. Okay, so here's the thing. This is pretty regular stuff. I mean, the back of a headstock is, is if it's 50 years old, it's going to have extra screw holes. Now, if you had a Strat or something like that, where typically you've got a clear finish and only a clear finish, uh, on the back of uh, the headstock, you would have more trouble hiding them. Uh, but uh, luckily with this, we are actually doing a solid color on this base, so we don't have to worry about the translucence or anything like that. We just have to get them solid enough. Now, typically speaking, uh, you know, this looks like a finished detail, but it's totally not. This is foundational. You need to do this first, and the reason is, is because we're gonna be doing a lot of sanding. And uh, that's actually a good thing because what happens is, is if we do the fill right now with the toothpick and the tight bond and it kicks off really good and it has a good bond, then we could just continue on sanding this headstock, ignore the fill. Eventually the fill is just going to get leveled off with whatever sanding method we have and it is going to be even better hid in the grain. Will it still be visible? Yes. Will the back of this look like a block of Swiss cheese? Less so. So we're okay on that. Anyway. I'm gonna go ahead and grab some toothpicks and some tight bond and let's go ahead and get to it. All right, so we've got the back of the headstock all dialed in and we've got all the toothpicks in there and the glue. Um, so you wanna let that kick off for about a day or two. Let the glue shrink, draw the toothpick down into the screw hole. Uh, you don't really have to meticulously go out of your way to try to address the way the back of the headstock looks. And the reason being is that we're so far uh, early in the process right now that we are gonna to have to go back resand the back of that headstock and that'll give us our nice smooth finish. You're going to notice that material drop down right away, give you a good flush surface. Now I would suggest doing the same on the front of the guitar uh, to fill in any screw holes that don't look factory. Uh, they're pretty easy to tell. If you're looking at a screw hole that is for a pick guard or anything like that, you can usually tell the factory because, uh, you know, the milling, you'll see a screw hole where the edge around the uh, top side of it has been knocked off. Um, you know, think of it as like uh, pushing a butter knife across the top of, uh, you know, a cup of sugar in it. It gives you a good level top. Nice clean milling on the top of the screw hole. Well, I can already see two or three screw holes under the pick guard that are either right next to another screw hole, which tells me that one of them shouldn't be there uh, and uh, two or three of them are very flared out and what that means is that it looks as though the screw was put in uh, without the hole actually being drilled so it pushed the pressure around the actual recess and you get this little edge around the top side where the wood kind of comes up and gets pressed against the pick guard what i do want to do before we finish this video up before we get into sanding and everything like that is and this is something i like to do on refinishes especially from the 60s and the 70s and the 80s what i like to do is i like to test a patch on the guitar now we did this on the jag when we were restoring that one because it had been spray painted blue. We wet sanded a certain section of the paint and then buffed it back to see what kind of reflectivity and depth we can get out of it. Because you will sometimes buy a guitar where it's like a refinish or it needs a refinish, but somebody might have clear coated it. And uh, you know you could potentially buff back that clear uh, or that base coat and maybe get some depth out of the grain. And maybe that would be you know the shortest and the easiest and the most desirable path for you. All right, so we went ahead and used some 1500 and tested it out on a small uh, part of the base, you know, right up where your arm rests. Uh, so how is the result? Um, that's, that's not 
bad. I'm going to be honest with you. I did not expect any reflectivity. Um, you know, Walnut is a weird finish on Gibson's. Uh, when it goes dull, it looks dead. I mean, there is no reflectivity on this paint. And there are parts of the base where it's not very clear if you're looking at finish or just bare wood. Because Walnut, when it gets severely oxidized, does look and feel like bare wood. Um, but obviously right there, we've got a pretty substantial amount of finish left. And decent enough thickness where we can hit it pretty hard with 1500 you know, and uh, not burn through. <laughs> if this were my base, I would stop here. I wouldn't do the refinish. Um, that walnut looks really good. <laughs> it looks great. It looks way better than it should. And, and here's the thing. There's a reason why it looks better than it should. Uh, because a lot of the times when you get these home-cooked finishes, people really aren't so far off as you think. Uh, they're usually pretty close. It's usually the last two or three steps of a refinish that get neglected out of the cycle and really fail to bring the product home. And that is wet sanding and buffing. Uh, when you're spraying a surface, um, the textural changes to the lacquer, the way that the solvents evaporate, uh, the temperature swing, how hot or cold it is, the moisture, all these different things come into play and create atmospheric variations in which your finish uh, may flash off and or cure with an imperfect reflective surface. This is what they call orange peel. It's like the surface of an orange. It's shiny, it's reflective, it's got depth, but the surface is not of glass. Um, when people are doing refinishes, often what they do is they shoot it, it looks great when it's wet and when it's kicking off, and they're really excited. They walk away, they come back, and it's flashed off. It's kind of got a satiny look to it, and there's some texture. And then they just kind of leave it, because they're just like, oh, okay. But what they don't realize is, is that wet sanding and buffing is really where you get that glass to come through. The difference between, say, a Chevrolet, you know, uh, and a Jag XJ12, I don't even know if they make the XJ anymore, but whatever, if they did, uh, is that one of them is shot with an, you know, just a standard HVLP gun. The other one is shot with an HVLP gun and then spends a week being wet sanded and rubbed by hand by a strange British man in Coventry. That's the difference between these rear finishes. If you really want that depth and that, uh, that gloss, you're going to have to wet sand. You can do without on certain shades, but when it comes to darker colors like walnut, black, uh, you know, Dakota red has a lot of depth to it and reflectivity. On those, they are just not going to hide those flaws. So this just goes to show you a situation where somebody did a refinish and thought it came out good. But in reality, they did a great job. Look at that. That looks awesome. <laughs> it looks so good. Look at it. When you get it in the light, it's just, uh, it's dynamite. It's the 70s all over. I just want to hang out in a pizza hut like 1982. Um, you know, so it just goes to show you that if you do have a refinish that you got on the shelf and maybe you didn't think it came out shiny enough or it didn't look quite so uh, bang on as when it was wet, get some wet sandpaper, go 1500, 2000, 2500, 3000, hit it with a buff, you'll be good to go. Anyway, enough of sitting around and staring at this thing and admiring this one small space of this guitar. I don't own this bass. It does need to be refinished. So as pretty as that walnut might be, and as good as a base coat as we can actually depend on it, other than some points that need to be fixed, we're actually not so far off from refinishing this thing. This thing is, uh, it's got a good foundation to go off of. Plus it means I also don't have to do a grain fill. And I like that. All right, let's go ahead and get started the next. Let's take the orbital out and start uh, leveling off some of the less smooth sections of this base. <laughs> 